Okay, part two. If you haven't seen part one, you have to watch that. This is completely use useless. I just didn't want to really upload a 30, 40 minute video on YouTube, uh, which is why we're here. So this is part two. Um, I erased the last one, uh, the last option, because quite frankly, uh, it just doesn't make sense. There's just, it's gonna be way too difficult with the variety of programming we're used to seeing across the competitions. Um, you just wouldn't be able to predict what a good, a mediocre, a great score is and then provide points to that relative to a bunch of other workouts. It's just not gonna happen. So I'm gonna go through, uh, this kind of the top here in black is are some pros and then the bottom here, also in black, even though I have a bunch of different color markers, uh, are some negatives. So, positives of this first system. It's simple, it's idiot proof as far as programming is concerned. As long as you can sort athletes from best to worst, you can give them the ranking done. Next, pre-event, you know the point spread and then the points to win overall. So you see it across the games, it's like, oh, you know, you know, if Pat wants to beat Justin Medeiros, he needs to win this event and then have three athletes come between him and then Justin, you know, come fifth or whatever. So it's like pretty simple. Um, pros of these systems. Uh, your fitness relative to the field accurately expressed. Uh, I would have put a little star here because we're going to get into that. And then it forces programming rules, which could be perceived as a positive or it could be perceived as a negative. Again, these are fairly similar, so those apply to both of those. Negatives. With this system, the biggest one in my opinion is log jams. Uh, and I don't know, there's probably a better term for that, but that's always what I've called it. So let's say you have a one rep max, um, say you have a one rep max snatch. and there are, you know, the first guy does 330, and then there's a guy who does 320, and then two guys do 300. And then there's like eight guys that snatch between 295 and 293, or 292. And so if you happen to be the guy that snatches 292 instead of 295, you're gonna get like 30 less points, uh, which is really frustrating because you're like, I'm not really any weaker than that guy who snatched two pounds heavier than me. He just snatched two pounds heavier than me because he chose to, to lift that amount. Um, maybe he had three attempts, or maybe he was in a later heat than me and he, he cherry picked my score. He said, oh, what did that guy, oh, 292, okay, cool. Then he snatches 293 and everyone does that. And then you go, man, like I just lost 30 points because I was in the first heat. Uh, that's the biggest flaw of this system, in my opinion. And the same could be said about a, you know, a five mile run. Um, you know, you're running for whatever, 30, 40 minutes. And then a bunch of athletes all finish within three seconds of each other. And whoever happens to be the last in that group gets way less points. He's like, am I really less fit? Am I really deserving of not getting 20 extra points? And you know, the argument to that, someone might say, well, just be more good, you know, just lift more, like run faster. It's like, yeah, it's true. But if we want to accurately represent who is better and who is worse by like some sort of number, um, this system fails at that. And then lastly, a big win, there's no benefit. So, you know, if you're in the lead, uh, you kind of coast to a lead because you're going, well, I might as well save my energy for the next one. And you know, we've kind of seen it this year with Guy, uh, super strong Brazilian boy. It's like, well, why would I snatch more? Why would I clean and jerk more if I'm not getting any more points for it? I'm just gonna lock, lock up the 100 points, move on, not gonna risk injury, uh, not gonna list, risk uh, you know, just expending energy somewhere where I'm not being rewarded. So that's another thing, uh, you're not really being rewarded for the big wins. Negatives on this one. This one, the big one I want to talk about that wasn't covered in the Morning Chalk article is how the last place impacts the average, impacts the standard deviation, and impacts the distribution of points in a big way. Obviously with this one, it's just first place and it's all a percentage off of first place because we're assuming whoever comes first here, that's like the peak expression of potential, so they get 100 points. We also assume that 100 points is the peak expression, but then we're also using all the other scores to create a gradient. Um, and I'm going to show you, and you can mess around with this again in the, in the description, I'm going to have this. Um, so let's just go, I'm going to go to the Rogue Invitational. Uh, and if you, if you want to mess around with this table, you know, it's in view only format. So you just have to go file, make a copy, and you can make a copy in your own Google Drive or download it as an Excel document and mess around with it in Excel if you have a, uh, if you don't have a Google Drive. Anyway. So right now, uh, the worst lift in the Max Bella Complex was 297 pounds, and they got 1.89 points. So I'm gonna change that 297 to 200 because maybe they uh, hurt their back. So we're gonna go back and forth here. Let's do this. 
Okie dokie, smoky. I don't know if you can see this. Anyway, I'm not gonna even try that way. Basically what happened was like that person's score went from 1.89 to 0 0.01. So they lost a point, right? Big whoop de doo for them. But what that did was uh, for someone who clean and jerk 340, they go from 62 points to 71 points. Or for someone who did 315, they clean and jerk 315 in this complex, complex, they went from 14 points to 38 points. So that's a huge point swing. That's like 24 points, uh, all, all based on what that last place person starts to do. So one, there's an opportunity for collusion. Uh, if you have a couple athletes that are buddies and maybe they have the same coach and they say, hey, you know, you're, you, you suck today. So just, you know, in certain events, I want you to suck really, really bad. And that's going to help our athlete, uh, you know, accumulate more points relative to the person he's trying to beat. Um, that's very, very easy to do. Um, in this system, that's impossible. And same with this system, that's impossible. I mean, this one, sure, the first place person could modulate their intensity a little bit, uh, but usually someone's hot enough on their heels that they can't really modulate it that much. But when one person, not to mention if two people, um, so again, if the next lowest guy brought his down again, uh, it, it just becomes crazy. So the, the last place person impacts us so much. And so at the top level, you hope there's a bit of integrity, but what if someone's injured, they're hobbling around, you know, it's a one kilometer run and uh, you know, it takes them like eight minutes to finish. All of a sudden, everyone's gonna be, uh, you know, between 190 points in that workout. So all of a sudden the run didn't matter. Um, and that would especially be true if it was a sprint. So the sprint and everyone's going a minute 15, a minute 16, a minute 16 and a half. And then one guy takes him four minutes, all of a sudden all those other scores are just gonna be, oh, you all get basically 100 points. Um, so that last person impacts the score so significantly um, that in a high level competition, it's dangerous because there's money on the line, but in a low level competition, uh, it's probably even more dangerous because you know the variety of skill levels you're gonna have is so much larger that if you just say, hey, go run a 2K, um, you don't really know how fast people are going to run at an intermediate or beginner level. Um, you might get someone who used to be a runner and they're pretty fit and they're you know crushing out a 2K pretty quickly, and then someone else is just kind of walking because they're at the beginning of their you know fitness journey, and this Z score just just doesn't work. So uh, I wouldn't recommend implementing it for that sole reason that the last place person, one person, uh, in the last place person especially impacting it so much. If they change how much they lift, if they go slow due to an injury. Um, not to mention, and we're going to get into this more, but the programming of a workout, you know, if a workout started with something very challenging and then progressed into something very not challenging, like let's say it was, oh, you know, do five deadlifts at 500 pounds and then run three miles. Um, you know, if someone's stuck on those deadlifts for 10 minutes because they have to do a lift every two minutes and then someone gets them, everyone else gets them done really quick, all of a sudden the workout just, you just drop the ball. So we're gonna get into that later, but even just in the cyclical workouts, like a 5K run, if someone just sandbags it, or in a lift and someone just lifts, you know, five pounds, and you see that um, with the lifts, uh, you know, in the CrossFit total in 2018, you know, there are athletes that lifted nothing because they got a, a no rep on their, on their strict press, or, you know, an athlete that was a bit injured and they just kind of, you know, they squatted 200 pounds, dead up to 200 pounds, strict pressed 100 pounds, and just kind of got through it. That's gonna impact the leaderboard. You delete that score, um, and it completely changes or you keep it in and you can't just delete it or keep it in because, oh, you know, I think that they're injured. You just can't do that. So big flaw there, massive flaw there, and it needs to be pointed out before someone tries to implement the Z-score. So for both of these, other issues are programming specifics, um, first place outlier impacts. Again, it's the same as the last place. It's not as important, but if you do have a field where you just have this, you know, like a total freak that can deadlift, you know, 700 pounds or um, can swim really, really fast, like, you know, really, really high caliber swimmer. Again, they're going to skew those scores in a really big way. If everyone else is like, oh, I'm an okay swimmer. And then one person is like really, really, really good. Um, and their score is, you know, so much faster. They're going to potentially get this points lead uh, that becomes hard to, hard to recover from or hard, um, you know, hard for them to lose in events where everyone's kind of on the same playing field. Uh, you know, even if they're not as good, you know, they might get 100 points in the swim, 
and then the next closest person's giving 70, and then everyone's 70, 69, 69, 68, uh, and down to 50 or whatever. And that that uh, 30 point lead, you know, they might keep coming 10th and 15th in a bunch of CrossFit workouts. But as we saw in that table I made before, a lot of times 10th, 15th, you're still getting 80 points. You're still getting you know 75 points, and so it's it's it is kind of harder, um, or even more than that usually. It is harder to, to lose a lead like that if you do happen to have someone who's a massive outlier. And so then it becomes the question, well, you know, do you want to reward them for that? Or is that like a bit too extreme if they happen to be like really extreme at something that's kind of uh, unique? And for the same thing, a poor form performance is unrecoverable, um, especially in this, in this one. I should have just put that over here. Um, because like I said, most of the time, the worst score in most events, I've spot checked a few and obviously looked at this, uh, um, yeah, I spot checked a few just dividing at the CrossFit Games. Usually you're looking at like 60 to 80 points is the worst score. Uh, it's not zero. But in a few workouts that are kind of, usually it's the weirder workouts. It's not just classic CrossFit workouts. It's not just thrusters and burpees or ring muscle-ups and snatches with some running. It's like the long runs or the swims usually. Um, or if someone's injured or something, or you know, maybe you get a really bad judging call or you fail a rope climb, um, your poor performance becomes unrecoverable. So you have such, whereas, you know, I mean, I finished on the podium uh, at the CrossFit Games and had, you know, basically last place finishes at the Games. Um, I don't think that would be possible anymore, or it would be very, very challenging, to, much more challenging to overcome it in this system. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, I mean, that's a, you know, maybe that's not for me to say, um, but it could be unrecoverable. And then lastly, I'm gonna get back to this program specifics, but time cap. So with an AMRAP, um, that's easy. 10 minutes accumulated as many reps as possible. No problem. With a one or max, easy, pounds. Now with everything else, everything else is for time. Most other workouts we see in competitions, um, complete a bunch of stuff, do it as fast as you can. Your finish time is your score. What happens if your time cap? Right now, in this system, if you're time capped, let's say five people get time capped, well, we know that they're gonna rank 36th through 40th, and we just need a method of determining who was closest to finishing. So if you're closest to finishing, you're 36. If you were next closest to finish, 37, and you get the points for that. You know, you get your 20 points, you get your 16 points, you get your 12 points, and so on. Now here, for every, for simplicity's sake, let's call it repetition. You need to determine the amount, you need to convert those repetitions that you missed into seconds. Because everyone else's times are in seconds, and in order to complete these calculations for either a Z score or a percentage, you need to have a score in seconds. So, depending on the workout, you need to know, well, how many seconds were they away from finishing? Uh, and that's really, really hard because depending on the workout, it's one thing if, you know, oh, they had 20 burpees left. It's like, all right, let's just say two and a half seconds of burpee. That's fair, right? Uh, what if it's a 500 pound deadlift for three reps? It's like, well, I mean, is that four seconds because they're gonna go touch and go? Or is that three minutes? Or is that never? You know, you don't know. And then you could look at every single CrossFit Games workout and you don't know. And then the harder part still, and this is still a problem over here, we see this all the time, is what if you finish in the middle of a run or in the middle of a swim or in the middle of a sandbag carry and there aren't lines on the floor so you just know oh five athletes were out there in the wilderness in the middle of a 1k run at the end of a long like chipper workout we don't know how far away they were from finishing and so what happens with these is you have to make time caps um, that are usually less aggressive, a lot more liberal, giving more athletes a time to finish. And then you need to create workouts that you are less and less likely for athletes to be time capped, which results in uh, stuff that's not as hard, right? Um, this year at the CrossFit Games, we had the freestanding handstand push-ups uh, with the heavy deadlifts and pretty much everyone got time capped. And you know, the, I mean, the time cap was whatever, 10 minutes or something. Even if the time cap was like, you can't have it 15 minutes because we're just gonna be standing around most of the time. Most people will be finished and some will be struggling. No one wants to see that. You need to keep the show moving. So logistically, you can't just have every workout with these super long time caps. 
um, to make it sure they finish. So then the only way to fix that is then to have workouts that aren't as hard, right? It's like, oh, you know, you have like all the workouts have to have lighter weights and you can't have higher skill and you can't have really challenging stuff. You can't have a lot of rope climbs because as soon as someone fails a rope climb, you're adding 45 seconds. You know, you're adding a minute 30. Um, if they fail, so you need to create this like fail safe with like so much extra time uh, that it will eat into the logistics of the competition, into the viewing experience, and it will dig into what you have available at your arsenal. You always have to have that in the back of your mind as a programmer. How do I convert some of these time caps into time? Um, and how can I create this workout so that it is likely people will not be time capped? And you don't want to slip into a trap of just programming AMRAPs, and you don't want to just start programming boring workouts uh, that aren't challenging the athletes, especially at the high level. And at the lower level, no matter what you do, someone's going to get time cap because the, the spread of skill level is going to be so much more significant than at the high level. You know, at every comp, it's like, oh, go do five muscle-ups. It's like, well, I don't, you know, no matter who you think you have there, there's probably someone that's going to struggle with that. All right, so a couple more programming issues. I went through a bunch of old CrossFit Games workouts and some regional workouts and just open workouts and thought of workouts that would not fit into this format. Um, and so if you do want to use this format, you can use these. Uh, you just need to be very, very hyper aware of the rules. And so again, that would force you into program rules. And right now there are none. You know, you go to a Wadapalooza, a Dubai, a Rogue, a CrossFit Games and Open, there are no rules uh, guidelining what is and what is not allowed for programming. Um, and this point system does not confine you to rules. Now, this point system would force upon you rules or it would just be a debacle, um, which I think some rules are a good thing, but is it likely that putting rules just for the sake of a scoring system is going to be the first rules we see? I don't think it's gonna work that way, but here we go. Uh, ba, 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 ba. So some workouts are built for linear scores um, and others are going to have these sort of jumps and scores, and you'll see that when a workout has something very high skill in the middle of it, especially like, you know, if you have a workout and right in the middle you have three peg boards, you're gonna see this, um, you know, change in times because of that. Uh, so in a one rep max, you need the ability to express your true strength. So the one rep max competition that was at the CrossFit Games in 2021 would not really work in these systems because, you know, Guimaraos, Sorry if I pronounced his name wrong. Um, he won, he hit the 305, he celebrated, and it's like, okay, like 310, okay, 315. And it's like, how much time are you giving him to adequately express that? Because the guy who got the opportunity to max out at, you know, 280, 285, that athlete had like a nice, you know, three minute, four minute break between lifts. And now with Guy, it's like those, those windows are shortening for him. Um, and he needs to keep lifting in order to, to express his one rep max. So um, another one rep max format that wouldn't work would be, um, I'm trying to think of another one here. But yeah, but that's, that's the main one. So with a one rep max, you just need to make sure the athletes have the ability to express their true strength potential. Um, like you saw in the quarterfinals in 2021, uh, you have 10 minutes to establish a four at max front squat. So obviously you have as much time as you want to do as much lifting as you want. Even just, uh, hey, you have your own platform, you get three attempts, like you saw at a few semifinals this year with the snatch. You know, so obviously instead of athletes just saying, hey, 290 is a solid number, they're like, oh man, if I get 300 or 315, I'm gonna be rewarded even more for that. Uh, and then another example is the 2012 snatch double under ladder. Um, you know, where everyone snatches 175 and it's just a conga line, you move, you move your snake your way through. You would just need to make sure in that, in that instance that, you know, the last person doesn't hit the final bar and they're like, hey, I want to keep going. You don't have another bar for them. There has to be another bar. It has, they have to go to failure. They have to have the ability to go to failure. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm just talking about time caps here. Uh, the two, 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 three interval workout uh, would not work because, so, you know, we saw it this year, Bjorgen Carl Gunnarsson, he almost finished. So his time, let's say he did finish, because he nearly did. So let's say his time was 1.59. Uh, you know, the next closest time is going to be, uh, it's going to be like 3.48. 
right? And is that person, uh, you know, a full one minute and 49 seconds worse in a percentage base than Bjorkman? No, of course not, because they were only 10 meters behind him, but then they had like another buy-in penalty. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you have to go watch the workout and understand it. But the two, 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 three intervals with these two, you just can't do anything like that. Um, because that is not an expression. The whole point of this is to express in a percentage um, relative to each other how much better you are in being rewarded for that. And in that case, Bjorgman is not one minute and 49 seconds better. Like in this case, you know, two minutes on double, uh, in this case, right? Um, you know, twice as good. It's, it's not, he's not, right? It's just, it's the workout skewing your perception of that uh, and it's a cool format I think it might be the best format I've seen so far when it comes to testing work rest work rest that interval there are other ways to do it um, but that's one of the best ones we've seen uh, executed really well in the competition and so that will be flushed down the toilet another one so when we talk about these sort of like high skill challenging workouts um, that you'd have to get rid of uh, something like the Cinco one the Cinco two from the 2000 and I want to say 13 or 14 CrossFit games, uh, heavy deadlifts, heavy weighted pistols, handstand walk, rest, and then muscle ups, handstand walks, uh, to, or muscle ups, handstand push ups, and lunge to finish. You know, a bunch of athletes got time capped in that. Um, you know, that's the big one. You know, just some, a workout like that, it just, you, you know, something that cool, that heavy, that high skill, people are gonna get time capped. And then it's like, how do you know how much, how many seconds you equate to a missed rep in a deadlift or, you know, the last couple feet of lunges or if you're failing on muscle ups, you just, you just don't know. Uh, so the favor, the favoring in this type of, you know, in this type of scoring system is always going to be the, the cyclical workouts, right? The thrusters at 95 pounds, the burpees, the pistols, the running, the rowing. Um, the wall balls, all that sort of stuff. The heavier and the higher technical skills, the more likely you are to be standing around waiting and failing. Uh, this becomes less and less accurate of a way to test. And another thing um, that impacts this is, so something like uh, if, if you program a workout where everyone's gonna basically go unbroken and pretty fast at a high level. So let's just say it's, you know, I don't know, 20 burpee box jump overs, 35 chest to bar and then 20 thrusters at 135 pounds cool workout um, would be a great like finisher to a competition or something potentially like a regionals finisher um, you know everyone at the games is going to do this unbroken right uh, maybe like you might see someone break it up and the only difference really here is that you know the 20 burpee box shots you can cycle them faster than these two yeah you cycle them a little faster a little shorter maybe um, so you know in this format, that is exciting as hell. Is it a good or a bad test? Whatever, um, that's for someone else to determine. It's probably good enough. Um, but, you know, the, the separation of scores for this at the CrossFit Games would be so tight that, you know, you just kind of play it safe, you cruise through it, and everyone's gonna be between 100 to 82 points in this format here, right? Obviously in this one, it's gonna be different. Uh, but in this one especially, you know, everyone's times are gonna be relatively similar. And so it's just gonna be kind of a wash. Like you're gonna look back on the weekend and this will not impact the leaderboard in a, in a, in a significant way, this type of workout. Whereas, uh, you know, something like the Cinco one or, um, you know, a swim workout is going to impact it because the scores are gonna be from 100 to maybe like, you know, 60. Um, and so that'll impact it in such, such a more significant way that, um, you know, I don't think that, you know, when you talk fitness relative to the field accurately expressed, and when you look at the definition of the decathlon and, you know, they're trying to equate, well, what is an elite performance, a 1,200 point performance in, in the javelin relative to the, to the high jump and what is a 1,000 point performance? I don't think this scoring system is gonna accurately do that if you're talking a swim workout and a cyclical CrossFit repetition workout like this, uh, at least not as well. Uh, you definitely can't do brackets. So you can't do the speed clean ladder, the speed clean and jerk ladder, or the speed snatch ladder that we've seen in a few CrossFit games because not everyone's doing the same thing. Um, and so there's no way to like accurately express in a percentage how much better uh, the winner of the third ladder is than the guy who just missed out on 
passing the first ladder. You just, you just, you can't because they're not doing the same thing. And it's the same reason why we can't do the two, 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 three intervals because you're just not doing the same thing. It can't be expressed in a percentage or converted to time. Uh, you can still, you know, you can still have a speed clean ladder, but everyone would just have to do the same speed clean ladder and then you just do it for time. But I would argue a speed clean ladder is a lot less effective of a test in this format than it is over here. The reason uh, I think a one or max is a lot more effective over here relative to a speed clean ladder because on the speed clean ladder, uh, I think the, the athletes are going to probably play a little more safe over here and just make sure they don't fail any lifts and move forward here. There's a lot more risk reward. They're like, man, if I really push the pace, I could get 30 points. Here, failing a lift is going to cost you 30 points, but just hitting all of them and sprinting or hitting all of them kind of fast is a difference in maybe three points. So you're not as likely to sprint um, in a speed clean ladder over here. Uh, if you look at something like the thruster wall walk, again, this comes back to that heavy high skill. The separation of points on the thruster wall walk from the first place finisher to the last place finisher, especially considering some people got time cap, um, is a lot greater than the 550 meter sprint. Um, so if you look at the 550 meter sprint, at the games from first to 20th, I wish I would have written this down somewhere. Uh, I can tell you for certain that the 20th place finisher, half the halfway mark, the half wave, the half water mark, uh, in the thruster wall walk, <laughs> They got a lot less than 95 points um, because you know as soon as you're just a little bit wor worse at wall walks or thrusters, add a minute, add two minutes. Like just you know don't even don't even blink. You're adding two minutes if, if you're if you're just a little worse with that lockout or you know your squat fatigue, whatever it is. It's just you're just you're tanking. And so what you're gonna find um, is, and I'm gonna I was gonna get to this a little later. But uh, people think, you know, with this, it's like, oh, you're going to, uh, you're going to see people really train their strengths to try to get that lead because right here, hey, if you win an event by 100 pounds or 10 pounds, you only get five points, whatever. Here, they're going to really push their strengths. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think you would shore up your weaknesses to an extreme over here, but only some of them. So something like the 100, the 550 meter sprint. You know, I came, I think, I have to look. I want to say ninth or twelfth out of 40 men at the games. Um, with the sprint and I'm like, you know, confident athlete. I go, you know what? I think I can prove that. I think I can go from 12th to fifth or maybe fourth next year if, if it came up again. So I'm going to work on my sprinting um, in this scoring system over here. No chance. Never working on my sprinting again. Won't touch a field other than right before the cross games. Cause it's like, Hey, I got 95 out of hundred points. Um, but what's scary is the thought of, you know, weighted ring muscle ups and one guy being able to do that, getting hundred points, me, failing reps and getting 40 points. Like that's frightening in this scoring system over here. So I need to shore up that weakness and spend all my time on like the heavy stuff, the high skill stuff, the swimming, the weird stuff. Um, whereas the 100 meter run or the 500 meter dash, it's like, it just doesn't matter anymore. Um, I don't think anyone other than like, if you're really, really struggling in that, but if you're within five seconds of the leader, it's like, cool, uh, what, what's next? So, you know, each of these is gonna have, it's, uh, it's going to impact not only the scoring, how, and in this one, it's going to impact how the worst athlete potentially performs if they're incentivized by one of the top athletes to sandbag. Um, but it's going to incentivize your training as well. And so you see with the decathletes, um, most of them don't really train their one mile. There's a high emphasis on, you know, the hurdles and a few other events because it's known that, you know, your training time can be spent best in specific events to accumulate the most points. It's kind of this tried and tested method in the decathlon where you know your time and training is best spent in these certain areas to accumulate the most points because you've seen the best, well, you know, what you define as well-rounded athletes are accumulating the most points in these specific events. That's where you spend your time. The mile is like, well, last event of the weekend, crack my knuckles, let's see how much pain I'm willing to endure. And you do enough running intervals training for the hundred and the hurdles and the, and the 400, so. All right, so quick little addition after watching it, I wanted to add in, I don't think athletes would push their uh, extremes. Like if you had, like for example, myself with swimming or a really strong athlete with the barbell, they might not push that in the training. However, when they are on the competition floor, they would obviously express as much as they could safely their max ability in, you know, for something like maybe me in a swim or Mionikoski in a swim or, uh, 
you know, the strongest athlete in the field with a barbell would definitely continue to lift heavier and heavier in the field. However, in your training, uh, like I said, I think your training would still be focused on your weaknesses. And I think in the, the third model, the percentage-based model, you would focus even more time on your weaknesses um, because you could train your strengths thinking, I'm going to get 100 points and I'll create that gap between me and second from 100 to 95 to 94 or 93 or whatever that is. But that strength might not come up, right? So you could train your deadlift all year um, and it might that, that strength might not come up just like your weakness. But if your weakness is something extremely common or, you know, like swimming at the games, uh, you'd be so afraid of that. I think you would put even more time into your weaknesses. Uh, let's see. I already talked about the deadlifting, free standing handstand push-up. Um, you know, the too many people get time capped. So even something like uh, the separator at the 2016 games with the strict ring handstand push-ups probably shouldn't have been in there for other reasons anyway. But uh, you know, there's so many time caps you just couldn't you couldn't introduce a new movement like that in these two formats. It just couldn't really be done. Uh, even the sled bar muscle up sled. You know, um, you know, we talk about the grass having too much friction and uh, for certain for certain lanes. But as a fail safe, it's like the least amount of points you're going to get is zero. It's like move on. Over here, uh, that difference in time, if the winning time is a minute and the slowest time is four or five minutes, um, like I talked about with something like a swim, you know, the amount of points you lose for something like that is so significant. It's going to be really hard to gain that back in a 500 meter run in a 20, 35, 20 chest of bar and so on. Um, and so that kind of leads us into. Uh, oh yeah, another another format you couldn't do is the uh, in the open with the squat clean, ascending squat clean reps with the toes to bar and double unders because you're doing, not doing the same workout. So if you got time capped at the 275 bar and all and someone kept going, they they get a better score than you in this format. But over here, they're actually working out for more time. Um, so you just couldn't have that kind of that those those windows of time where you're getting cut like a musical chairs format. You just couldn't have that. So, really what this comes down to with these two formats is, is this percentage an actual true percentage of your ability relative to the field? Um, is the percentage of how much slower you are an actual representation of how much, how, the percentage better you are than the other athletes? So in an AMRAP, if I get 200 reps and someone gets 100 reps, am I 50% better than them? Um, you know, in a, and, and you know, that goes for everything, that goes for all these workouts. Is that percentage of time actually that percentage better? Because it's the whole purpose of going to this. And I think when you look at it workout by workout and you compare, you know, traditional, a bunch of CrossFit Games workouts and you say, okay, what's, if we use this, you know, who got 100 points and who got, you know, 60 points or 80 points? And do we feel like those two scores across the board, 180, 180, 180, are those consistently showing the same gap in ability, the same gap in performance or fitness? You know, if it's a strength event, the same gap in strength. If it's an endurance event, the same gap in endurance. And I've looked at them and I don't think that they are. Uh, it doesn't seem like, you know, you're accurately really showing uh, who is, you know, 20% better. If you're 20% better, you're not actually getting that same reward. And I think that comes from the fact that CrossFit's kind of crazy. And a workout with a bunch of pegboards and double unders and overhead squats. You know, if you're just a little better at pegboards, you know, if you're 5% better at pegboards, you're gonna go three minutes faster. Um, it's not like you're just gonna go 5% faster or, you know, 30 seconds faster or a percent faster, you get a percent more reps closer to Cole Sager's winning time. You're gonna have these large leaps in ability. Um, whereas something like running, I think it's a little more linear. Uh, that's about it. So I can't believe that took so long. I didn't think it would take that long. Um, lastly, <laughs> if you're still listening, you crazy YouTubers. Uh, if you're still listening, someone mentioned, well, it's not real true fitness if we're not comparing like power output. So someone's, I've heard someone make this argument about like, um, oh, you know, like there's the video of me doing burpees and I don't have to jump and Fraser has to jump to touch the, to touch the red line. Or they say, oh, it's not really fair that you know, rope climbs are harder or, you know, the box jumps, you know, it's, it's, it's harder for someone who's shorter to jump up. Um, and so like, there's gotta be a way to standardize that relative to your height. Now you start doing that and it's like, okay, do we standardize the run distance relative to your leg length? 
Uh, do we standardize the swim distance relative to arm length? And then you go, okay, for a deadlift, instead of a deadlift, is it just, um, you know, we find the shortest athlete and where they deadlift to, okay, that's three feet, six inches, and we put like a laser line, and I just have to deadlift up to that three feet, six inches, which is, to me, my kneecap. Um, or is it, you know, oh, with thrusters, you know, I have further to go, so I'm gonna divide that distance uh, by the other person's distance. They have to do 21 reps, I only have to do 18 and a half reps. Um, with pull-ups, is it, do we find the heaviest athlete and everyone else has to wear a weight vest, so they're the same weight <laughs> as that person? Or is it a calculation of limb length and I don't have to do as many because I'm taller? Um, or I don't have to go as high, um, maybe there's like a, you know, so it's, <laughs> anyway, um, the whole weight class and height class thing in CrossFit uh, and trying to like correlate your performance relative to like a Sinclair, because if you do Sinclair for the weights like Fran, then you also have to scale the body weight aspect. You can't say, oh, well, you know, the, the, the thruster bar is 30% of your body weight for everyone. It's like, well, then what about you know, the, the only people that win a competition are going to be the light people. So it's like, well, how do you, how are you going to make it easier for the heavier people on the pull-up bar? Oh, they have to do less reps. It just becomes a total dog joke. So no one that takes the sport seriously and understands what's actually going on is ever going to really recommend that. Um, I know Chris Spieler, you know, mentioned that he didn't like that idea either. And he's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum to me. The only difference could be if you really wanted to, you could have a competition that was a weight class competition where you say, hey, anyone under 200 pounds competes over here, anyone over 200 pounds competes over there, and they both just have workouts and you go for it. But um, I don't see that catching any steam uh, because you know you see the CrossFit Games all the time and many events that athletes of all different sizes, if it's well-programmed, maybe that's a video for another day on what is good and bad programming in general. Um, you know, you can see athletes of a lot of different weights and sizes do well, which I think makes the sport uh, exciting. If it's well programmed and well balanced, you can see a pretty, pretty good uh, myriad of body types being successful. All right, that's it. Bye.